Good morning. Today we're going to talk about companion planting. I know a lot of people have talked about this and I tend to stick to some slightly more obscure topics sometimes, but I think uh, it's a good idea to talk about it and uh, and review it for even for people who are familiar with it but uh, haven't perhaps incorporated it yet in their gardens. <clears throat> so what is companion planting? Companion planting is when you take multiple plants and put them together in the same space either for increased benefit to you or for benefits that the plants might receive from having the companions nearby. So it, it's necessary when you are thinking about companion planting to, uh, to think about obviously what you're planting together and how they will use the resources, whether it be soil or space or time. So we'll talk about that a little bit in this uh, episode. Uh, and it's also important to figure out whether or not these two plants or multiple plants will be compatible with each other. And that's another issue that I'll cover below. So first, I kind of want to, you know, I, I'll let you know, first of all, I do a lot of companion planting, but there are some downsides. And it's important to sort of recognize those downsides, I think, and address them because this isn't a, like a, like I, I say with a lot of things, this isn't a one size fits all kind of solution. I use companion planting in some of my gardens and in some places I haven't used it as much. Maybe I could incorporate it more, but I haven't at this point in time. So downsides, not great for mechanical harvesting or fast harvesting if you have to uh, do something for, you know, something that you are harvesting for the marketplace and you need to gather a whole lot of strawberries. Well, if those strawberries are interplanted with other things all over the place and you have a certain set amount of time and you need to get these to your, uh, your market stall, having them interplanted with lots of things might be a downside for you in that situation. So it has to be something where, where you have some luxury of time uh, for harvesting or you're not harvesting a whole lot of it at any one given time. Like for instance, if you are growing squash and you have interplanted that with, with beans and you know corn, for instance, sort of in the traditional companion planting that we talk about, uh, the three sisters companion planting, um, that's probably not going to be too much of a downside for you because you probably won't be in your backyard harvesting tons of squash at the same time. So you can go out and you know pick one squash or three squash if they're like summer squash or what have you and be very happy with your harvest. Whereas if you were picking hundreds of uh, quarts of strawberries, that would be a problem. Um, some plants just don't grow well together. And there's something called, uh, and this is a hard to pronounce word, so I'll probably get it wrong, but uh, Allelopathy, allelopathy or allelopathy. Uh, I've never actually heard anybody pronounce it, but I've read it a lot. So allelopathy, it is where a plant creates uh, chemicals that will basically discourage other plants from growing in its space. And this is often true of nut trees. Nut trees do not make great companion plants. It depends on the nut. Uh, but uh, like, for instance, walnut trees have a very uh, strong chemical that they release that makes it difficult for other plants to grow in their vicinity. Same is true of oak trees. So you definitely want to think about that when you're thinking about companion planting. It's important. Um, and, you know, in some cases, some traits just don't mix. Some traits between plants just don't mix. So if you're growing pumpkins, for instance, with those big wide leaves, you need to grow it if you're going to use it as a companion plant for something. You need to grow it with something that's gonna have the strength and resiliency to get up beyond that initial shady layer up to the sunlight. Otherwise, obviously this is, you know, they're gonna have 
uh, shade much of the time and it just probably won't work as well. So this leads me on to talking about the niche uh, factors. So you want to think about niches and typically people talk about a niche in time, which means one plant perhaps grows or is harvested at a certain time and another plant is harvested at a different time but you can grow them together. And niches in space and that has to do with the generally the the vertical space that a plant occupies, the ground covers, the uh, low um, herbaceous the shrubs, the vines, the trees, they each occupy different levels and that's important to think about when you're thinking about planting things together. So often you can use that to your advantage. Um, so some examples, you know, squash and beans, um, they they give this example in the Three Sisters, I say they, this is just a very popular um, concept is that you can plant squash and beans together, the, the squash shade the soil and, you know, keep the, the uh, uh, weeds down while the beans grow up but uh, provide nitrogen for the squash. Uh, and that's, you know, perfect world kind of scenario, uh, but I actually have found that they do grow pretty well together and one, one thing that was surprising to me was last summer I actually grew squash and beans on the same trellis and what I found was that it, there was this niche in time effect. So this big trellis has squash and beans on it. I'm harvesting the beans and the squash I harvest later. So the squash actually took longer to get up to the trellis and start really filling in the trellis and by the time the squash was fully established the beans were starting to wane anyhow and then I was ready to just let the rest of the beans go to seed let the squash take over and, and you know in some cases shade out the beans and and this this worked much better than I expected I actually thought that it might not work very well together and they did work pretty well so that was niche in time even though they were occupying the same space the same vertical space and so so it's kind of an interesting twist on the whole uh, idea of a niche in time. Um, another example of niche in time is, say you've got garlic that you've planted, and you know that takes up a lot of space. You could conceivably plant other things with that garlic, so long as you've got enough nutrient content that you're either delivering to the soil or the soil already has kind of baked into it. And so you could plant radishes with your garlic. For example, and I'm going to do that this spring and give it a shot and see how it works. It's not something I've done before, but generally when I planted garlic, I've interplanted it with some other things and, and it hasn't worked as well. And so I've tended to plant garlic by itself, but I think this year I'm going to branch out and try a few more things that, that I can do so that when I eventually harvest my garlic in you know mid-late summer, that I will have harvested something else before that and maybe be able to plant something after that. So that's the niche in time, another example. Niches in space. Uh, we talked about the ground covers with taller plants. We, so we already talked about that one. Um, but then there's another, there's another third kind of niche that I'd like to talk about, and that is a niche in purpose. So Obviously, some plants are there for your food production, but some plants also occupy different purpose niches. So some will shade the soil from the sun, which is really important. So you've got living mulches. Um, some will provide soil enrichment, like beans. We talked about adding nitrogen to the soil. That really is more when you put the, uh, the vines into the soil and let them decompose there. That's when they will release more nitrogen. Uh, and also uh, bringing, plants that bring, bring nutrients up from the subsoil. And so examples of that might be like deep rooted plants. For instance, like a daikon radish, things that you might plant and, and let actually do that go to seed and bring, you know, comfrey is a great example of that. That brings, brings nutrient up from the subsoil 
and then you can use it as a chop and drop and provides an awful lot of nutrient value to the plants that can't reach that far down with their roots. So and there's another, another purpose for big rooted plants like a daikon radish is that they, they create spaces in the soil when they eventually decompose. So they, they give you soil aeration, which is also very important, especially if you're doing a no-dig garden where you're not tilling the soil. You do still need to provide aeration, and so planting things like daikon radish can help to create these voids in the soil as they, as they decompose and contract, and then you have more spaces for uh, for air to get in, it's easier for insects and things to make their way through that kind of space. And so it's a good way to kind of give your soil more, um, uh, more moisture retention and things like that. So another thing you might want to think about is when you're integrating plants, integrate some flowers. And flowers have multiple purposes in your garden and they can work as great companions. Um, many of these purposes have to do with uh, attracting or uh, preventing pests. So marigolds, classic example. Marigolds uh, create uh, chemicals that discourage certain kinds of pests from visiting your garden. Good thing to have. Uh, and you know, people have varying results with that. I usually include some marigolds in my system, and and. I, I assume that that's contributing to the fact that I have pretty good gardens. Uh, sometimes you don't know all the reasons. Um, another uh, thing you want to think about is pollinator attractors. So what is it that you have in your garden that is going to bloom? Flowers. We're still talking about flowers. What will bloom and hopefully at the same time as other things in your garden are needing pollination and bring in those pollinators, bring in the bees, bring in the uh, the you know the types of like like hopefully beneficial moths um, and uh, although there are some that, that aren't so great and you know butterflies bring in uh, wasps that help with the pollination process there are so many different insects that help with pollination not just honeybees you know even things like uh, like a, uh, a wood boring bee will do an awful lot of good in your garden, even though it might not do so great in your house. Um, then you have a, another kind of flower that actually attracts pest predators. So it attracts the tiny wasps, for example, these uh, parasitoid wasps that, that will lay their eggs, their, their eggs into pests. And, uh, and you know, essentially attack them from the inside, it's kind of gross. Uh, you have other types of uh, plants that will attract um, ladybugs and praying mantids. And so, so quite often these are flowers. Sometimes actually I find that my, my mantids love to hide in my strawberry, my alpine strawberry uh, beds in the, the sections of the, the beds that I put alpine strawberries in. So that's another uh, another example of a plant that that can that can help out multiple ways. So so what what are the main reasons for companion planting? You know, that's it's I would say the mutual benefit factor. And also for me maximizing space because I have a small planting area, so the more I can take advantage of it, the better. You know, in terms of mutual benefits, you have things that are ground covers, things that can act as trellises for other plants, like trees. The right kind of tree can act as a trellis for other, uh, other climbing plants. You have the nitrogen-fixing plants that can, uh, that can give mutual benefits to plants. And you also have the plants, like I talked about, that bring up nutrients to the soil, from the soil. So, so those are the main reasons that I use companion planting is to maximize my space and to also get those benefits, those mutual benefits that plants offer each other. So thank you so much. Please give me a thumbs up and subscribe to this channel. I would love to hear your comments on companion planting below. I'm going to talk more about companion planting in upcoming episodes where we talk about specific guilds 
of plants. A guild is another word for a companion plant uh, grouping, uh, where I talk about specific guilds that I have used that have worked for me and that you could apply in your garden. So if you want to go and buy some, some plants this spring and put them together, I will give you some examples of that, uh, especially with respect to perennials in upcoming episodes. Thanks a lot for joining. Uh, please check out foodforestgardenclub.org. That's where we get together online in person. We've got forums and we, we share information, we share seeds, we have some fun contests. So it's a, it's a great place to check it out, hang out, and it's growing. We're getting more people uh, every week joining. And so I look forward to hopefully seeing you there. So thank you so much and have yourself a great day.